hope that you've been enjoying World Kitchen as much as I have. It has just been great to hear people's experiences in different countries, to get a recipe and ingredients and be able to cook a dish from that country. And then also, and maybe the most important part of it is, to learn about what the Presbyterian Church USA is doing in mission in those countries. We have had incredible responses from the different uh, workers who are in those countries and it's been wonderful. These recipes and ingredients are, that are authentic, just like the stories and the work that we talk of. I hope you'll join us for the next episodes of The World Kitchen. Thank you. In Peru, the exploitation of mining and oil resources has led to major economic growth in recent decades. Yet, the gap between rich and poor in Peru is one of the highest in the Americas. Among the most impoverished peoples are indigenous populations whose livelihoods and way of life are gravely impacted by the combination of air, land, and water contamination. Furthermore, Peru is one of the most vulnerable countries in the world to climate change. It's in this context that Presbyterian World Mission joins in ministry with its global partners, Joining Hands, Peru, and the Evangelical Church of Peru. Presbyterian mission worker Jed Cobal assists the Peru Joining Hands Network. Joining Hands is an initiative of the Presbyterian Hunger Program that addresses root causes of hunger. Jenny Cobal is the Peru site coordinator for the Presbyterian Young Adult Volunteer Program, which sends people ages 19 to 30 to serve in communities in need in the United States and abroad. In addition to service, the young adult volunteers experience emphasizes living in intentional Christian community, spiritual formation, and vocational discernment. Each young adult volunteer in Peru is placed with one of the eight NGOs or churches that form the Joining Hands Peru Network. Through the Peru Mission Network, PCUSA churches and presbyteries partner with Joining Hands member organizations to discern together how God calls us to learn from one another in God's mission. My name's Steve Kenyon. Uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about our personal experience in Peru. And after that, uh, my wife Catherine will uh, give a cooking demonstration uh, for Causa Rellena. I've been interested in Peru for 10 or 12 years now. Um, I go down to the uh, Amazon side of the Andes uh, to do a long-term study of the butterflies of uh, this particular valley in conjunction with the Natural History Museum of Peru. Uh, our trips take us uh, to Cusco and from there we take a, a van uh, up and down the Andes until we get to the rainforest on the Amazon side and uh, we've been doing a taxonomy of the butterflies of that area. Uh, Peruvian cuisine reflects the uh, varied history of the peoples of Peru, and that includes the Spanish colonizers, the indigenous uh, Americans, as well as um, Africans, uh, Japanese, and even uh, Germans. And uh, so we chose Causa Reina, which reflects the traditions of both Spain and the Quechua people of the Andes. Catherine's granddaughter Esther uh, will also give you her experience as a volunteer in mission to Cusco and uh, I am looking forward to hearing her side of uh, her experience in Peru.
hello, my name is Esther Pruitt and I am Catherine and Steve Kenyon's granddaughter. Um, I had the privilege of working and learning in Peru during the summer of 2018. I lived with a missionary family for two months. Um, the purpose of um, our time in Peru was really to be learners. So neither one of us had any missions experience. We'd both been outside of the country before and knew the value of cross-cultural experiences and how much they can shape and train you. Um, but we had never really served with a church um, to kind of be infused in a community and be sharing the gospel. So that was really exciting for us. And when we first arrived, we kind of expected to be predominantly paired with MTW's work. Um, MTW has a clinic in Cusco, and they also have a, um, an orphanage for toddlers in Cusco. And we kind of expected that most of our time would be spent in the orphanage, which was called, which is called the Josephine House. And um, while we did spend a good amount of time there, what ended up happening was when we got into the community, um, our missionaries told us about this new ministry that was in the same neighborhood that was a safe house for girls who had experienced sex trafficking and the girls were ages four to 16 and the missionaries we were with had had a hard time um, whenever they brought in interns for the summer they'd had a hard time um, getting actually girls to come so they had had this ministry on their heart for a while but they didn't have the right people to kind of plug in with that ministry just because they wanted to be careful and um acknowledging kind of the fears that girls might have towards men coming in and working at the site. So they saw it as a great opportunity that me and Zoe, my friend, were kind of like right around the right age um, to be trusting and trustworthy and um, to be soft when we went to that site. So Zoe and I would spend Monday through Thursday working at the safe house, which was called The Seeds. Um, and the safe house was actually run by a Brazilian family. Their church had funded that that ministry. And so there was a lot of great culture to be able to interact with there where the people supervising us were Brazilian who were trying to navigate the culture of Peru. And so they had a lot of great insights for us as we were also trying to navigate a new culture. Um, and luckily they, um, the, the Brazilian family who ran this ministry, they had a son who spoke Portuguese, Spanish, and English, so we had a translator the whole time, even though we were still trying with Spanish. That was really helpful to have a translator when we were engaging in deeper and more sensitive conversations, and also as we were giving our testimonies to the girls. So that was, um, yeah, our, our weeks ended up looking like Monday through Thursday, working at the safe house, and then Fridays, working at the Josephine house. Yeah. And I think one of the things that stands out about my time in the safe house is realizing that different cultural perspectives really translate to your personal understanding of God. So at Covenant College, we talk a lot about cultural understandings of time and of control and of justice, um, but it was really great to be able to have tangible experiences of how people view that differently. So Zoe and I, coming from an individualist culture, we understood um, situations that we were in as something that we still had a little bit of control over and that we could navigate and maybe even get out of um, or kind of practice self-advocacy in a pretty direct way. But for the girls we were interacting with in the safe house, they had this um, external locus of control. That's kind of, that's kind of the term we use when we're talking about culture. Internal meaning you can kind of change your circumstances and external meaning that someone else, the Lord, is um, if you're a believer, the Lord is um, kind of deeming those circumstances and that your posture is very much dependent on what he calls, like calls on in your life. So when we were talking about their situations, they had a lot of questions for us about God's goodness and how God could be just if the situations that were happening to them or had happened to them um, could really be something he had allowed. So it was honestly, the topic we spent most time on was prayer and, and praying to the Lord to provide justice in our lives. And that was really helpful for me and Zoe, um, as I think we had a pretty small view of prayer before going into the summer. Um, but coming out of it, learning that there were a lot of circumstances that because of the culture, because of the government, because of um, it being a very predominantly male-oriented culture, that a lot of these girls were in situations that they were not able to get out of. And so 
um, by partnering with them in prayer for God to do something crazy in their lives and to deliver them himself was huge for us. And so that has really shaped my perspective as I've re-entered into the States and um, as I think about my time in Peru all the time, um, remembering to pray to the Lord of Justice that he would be active in their lives and um, would be able to provide deliverance for them from those situations. So. Today, we're going to show you how to make a Peruvian dish called causa rellena, which basically means stuffed potatoes. And you can see there that you've got several layers, a potato on the top and on the bottom, and then a mixture of tuna and uh, mayonnaise and some other things that Catherine will uh, uh, talk to you about. Today, we're going to make rellena. I'm going to peel about two pounds of yellow potatoes. Potato is a staple in Peruvian diet. They originated in the highlands here and are used almost daily. I'm going to try to make a cut them in half. We're going to put them in some water, boil them, and boil them to about just under fork tenderness. We don't want them mushy. They're not going to be a whipped consistency. It's going to be a little rough, a few very soft lumps. And that helps it show, hold its, its shape. We'll do this again with this one. These are pretty good sized. We have cooled the potatoes to room temperature and now we're going to mash them. Some recipes call for a ricer to be used. I don't have one but I'm using this tool. The important part is not to have the, the potatoes to be whipped potatoes. We want it to be more a, a, a rougher mash. And these are just about perfect. They're cooled down, ready to, to be mixed. We'll be adding in our other, our other pieces. And now we have our mashed potato. We're going to add some other ingredients. We have a quarter cup of olive oil. It's no particular kind of olive oil. It'll help us mix everything in. We're also going to add in lime juice. We're adding in a quarter cup. And a very common paste and is the paste called ahi Amarillo. This happens to be a yellow, in English it says, yellow hot pepper light paste. And we're adding one tablespoon. The tablespoon, uh, it suggested maybe one to two tablespoons, but one I find is enough for me. It gives it that yellow color. This, this now becomes the bottom and top layers of, of our rellena. I'm going to put a, to taste um, a little pepper and again to taste just a little bit of salt. And there we go, all mixed together, all ready. One of our interior layers for the relenia is tuna fish, a tuna fish base. And you uh, may realize that uh, Peru is on the Pacific Ocean. And they eat a lot of fish. You can also make a relenia 
with chicken instead of tuna. And we're going to add in, let's see, first we'll put in three tablespoons of mayonnaise. And the tuna is, that I've used today, is with from the packaged tuna. We will also add to that some cilantro, Italian parsley, or parsley, this is parsley that we have today, finely cut. And we have also two tablespoons of red onion, and you can adjust the amount to suit your taste. Last but not least, a teaspoon of lime juice. Yeah, give it a good stir. And then we're going to have it cool in the refrigerator for up to 30 minutes. That's good, nicely mixed. It's time to assemble the rellena. We will have four layers. We're going to start with our potato. And this first layer will end up actually being the top. Later on, we flip it upside down. A whole lot of fun. So we are using a medium-sized casserole dish. The dish has been lined with a plastic wrap. It helps with the removal of the final product. Some recipes say to fill the bottom Third, but I keep saying to myself, okay, this is really the top. Next, we are going to put in our avocado layer. Now we come to the tuna layer. Remember, we have the tuna with the parsley and the, a bit of salt and pepper. Let's get these, empty this in. Smooth that so it's somewhat even. So it's about three packages of, of tuna. And back to what will be the bottom. And we'll see how much we need to have a good base. The Amaria paste really added color to the already yellow potatoes. And it has just enough texture and thickness to it to, to um, spread and smooth quite nicely. Now we're going to cover the top just a, a, a bit so that we can let it set for a few minutes in the refrigerator. Now we have a lovely serving plate. We're going to be transferring the relenia onto the serving plate. Okay, now we, we're not quite centered, but that's going that's to gonna work. That's lovely, lovely. Now we wanted some decorations on top, our garnishes. Now 
we're going to, you can see on the interior, the levels between the potato and the bottom and top layers and the tuna fish in the middle. And there are avocado slices in there. And another view would be if I cut another slice and put it over here, aha, you can see a actually a piece of the avocado. And it's easier to see the piece down here. Delicious.